In geography, we're going to revise all sorts of gemstones, scratch tests, the hardness, the funky stuff underneath the kettle, meteors and glow-in-the-dark stones. Stay tuned for more information. In rare conditions, exceptionally beautiful and hard-wearing crystals form a, in igneous or metamorphic rock to become gemstones. The element carbon can crystallize into a diamond. Carbon can crystallize into a diamond, the most precious jewel of all. And the minerals corundum and beryl can form rubies, sapphire and emeralds. Gemstones are highly prized for their beauty and rarity. Diamonds are famous for the way they sparkle. A cut diamond reflects more light than other gems and splits the light into colors, giving the diamond its fire. They are also famous for being the hardest substance known. No other material can scratch them. And they are far from indestructible, but they are far from the indestructible. Like coal and other forms of carbon, they can burn. In areas where there are porous rocks, you may come across a dull rock shaped like a potato on the ground. These potato stones are called geodes and are highly prized by mineral collectors. If the rock is sliced in half, inside is a cavity lined with crystals. Geodes form in cavities in porous rocks. Fluids rich in dissolved minerals such as quartz seep into the cavity. The quartz crystallizes on the inner surface and the crystals can grow big enough to fill the entire geode. When the rocks erode, a chunk may bre break off. The hard crystals Crystals hold the chunk together while the outside wears down and forms a dull looking potato shaped rock. The way of identifying a mineral is to see how easy it is to scratch. All minerals have a hardness rating from 1 to 10 on a Mo scale of hardness. And those with a high number can scratch anything with a lower number on the scale. The Mohs scale was made by a German mineralo mineralogist, Friedrich Mohs. He developed the hardness scale in 1812. The scale is based on 10 minerals shown below, starting with talc, which has a hardness of 1. Some Everyday equivalents are given al alongside the minerals. Okay, so talc has the hardness of ice. Gypsum has the hardness of a fingernail. Calcite is number three, has the hardness of a penny. Number four on the scale is fluorite and it has the hardness of a nail an iron nail okay appetite which is number five has the hardness of a pen knife blade and number six is orthoclase it has a the hardness of a hard steel file and then number seven is quartz and sandpaper can it has the same hardness as the quartz Number eight is topaz, and the hardness of the topaz is the same as the emery board. That's the board that um, shapes your nails, eh? And then number nine is corundum, and it's got the hardness of a ruby, which is super hard. And then number ten on the scale is a diamond. There's no equivalent to a diamond. A mineral's color can help you identify it, but colors can be misleading. The mineral quartz, for example, comes in many colors. A better way of assess assessing color is to do a streak test, which always gives the same result. You can look up the streak color of every mineral in the field guide. This test applies only to minerals and not rocks. Pure quartz is colorless. 
but chemical impurities can make it purple, like amethyst, pink, green, yellow or black. Quartz is also hard and transparent, so coloured forms make good gemstones. But whatever the colour, the streak that it makes is always white. As well as looking at a mineral's colour and streak, geologists look at its lustre, how it reflects or transmits light, making it shiny or dull. This is also an important clue to a mineral's identity. Some minerals are shiny like metals, others glisten like glass, and others are pearly, greasy or silky. Minerals may be transparent, which means you can see through them, translactant, which means they can let light through, or opaque, which means they don't let any light through at all. Every day, about 500 tons of dust and rock from space collides with planet Earth. Much of the space debris burns up as it enters the atmosphere, producing streaks of light called shooting stars. However, particles smaller than a millimeter wide can sometimes slip through the air without getting hot enough to burn. These micrometeorites flake through the sky as dust and they fall to the ground in rain. With a powerful magnet and a bit of luck, you stand a real chance of finding one. A micrometeorite can only be seen through a powerful electron microscope. The surface is smooth and round, but crystals of metal are visible around the outside. Space rocks that land on Earth's surface are called meteorites. Most are fragments of broken asteroids, colossal rocks that orbit the sun. Those made of iron come from the core of the asteroids. Only about 500 meteorites bigger than a football hit Earth each year, and most of these end up in the sea. If you shine ultraviolet light on certain minerals, they glow with extraordinary colors. We call this glow fluorescence. Some minerals always fluoresce with the same color, but others vary according to the impurities they contain. And some minerals continue to glow when you switch off the UV lamp, producing a ghostly light called phosphorines. Phosphorines. Okay. Another way to make rocks glow is to rub them together. Take two pieces of milky quartz into a very dark room and wait 10 minutes for your eyes to adapt. Rub the rocks forcefully and look for an orangey glow called triboluminescence. Alternatively, crunch on wintergreen flavored sweets in a dark room while looking in a mirror. Okay? What causes fluorescence? When ultraviolet light strikes fluorescence, a fluorescent mineral, the atoms in the mineral absorbs energy from the light. Tiny particles called electrons, which form the outside of these atoms, become excited. The electrons then lose the extra energy they have absorbed by emitting particles of visible light, which we see as a colored glow. As rain seeps through the ground, it dissolves some of the minerals in rock. Mineral water, sea water, river water and tap water nearly always contain minerals picked up in this way. You can't usually see them, but you can often taste them. The salt flats in Death Valley, California, USA formed in the same way as the cloudy mineral patches on CD cases in about 50 50,000 years ago, Death Valley was a gigantic lake, 145 kilometers long and 180 meters deep. When the Ice Age ended between 14,000 and 10,000 years ago, California became hotter and drier and the lake dried out completely. 
Today, all that remains is the parched lake bed, which is covered with a thick crust of mineral salts. And one of the most common minerals in tap water is calcium bicarbonate, which comes from limestone. Calcium bicarbonate makes water hard. When hard water boils, heat turns it into calcium carbonate, which is insoluble. insoluble. This forms most of the furry lime scale you find inside your kettles. Stalactites and stalagmites are made of the mineral calcite, which comes from limestone. Some rain is mildly acidic, it dissolves calcite as it seeps through the ground, hollowing out tunnels, potholes and caves. Dripping water then redeposits the calcites in icicle shapes. When Epsom, with Epsom salts you can recreate the process in a miniature jar. But your Epsom salt stalactites formed because some of the water evaporated as it dripped off the stream, causing dissolved Epsom salts to turn back into crystals. A similar thing happens in limestone caves. As cave water drips through air, some of it evaporates. As a result, calcite crystallizes out of the solution and grows into stalactites. The following saying might be very useful to tell the difference between a stalactite and a stalagmite. Stalactites are tightly to the ceiling, while stalagmites grow from the ground and might reach the stalactites. If you could speed up time, you'd see the rocks on Earth's surface crumbling and washing away as if they were made of sand. The process that destroys and carries away rock is called weathering and erosion. When rocks weather, they crumble, rot and dissolve. The debris is then washed or blown away in the process of erosion. Weathering and erosion usually happen slowly, but they are constantly at work changing the landscape. You can see evidence of them everywhere. So, weathering is when the rocks break down. Weathering agents, which means the stuff that weathers, is water, ice, wind, animals and growing plants. Erosion is the movement of the broken down stuff. So what moves broken sand and rocks? The water, wind, ice and gravity like avalanches and rock falls. Eh? And then deposition is the dropping of new sediment in a new place. So the formation of an island is like that. The waves move the sand and move the sand through erosion and when it stops by a new place and forms an island that is deposition. Sand dunes work exactly the same way. Given enough time, water can alter or destroy rocks, including the very hardest ones. One way that water attacks rocks is through action of ice. Liquid rocks seep into the pores and crevices in the rock and then freezes when the temperature drops. As the water freezes, it expands, exerting enough pressure to split the rock into chunks. A good place to see weathering, the weathering power of ice is on mountains. In these cold, wet places, water often freezes at night, but then thaws in the morning. In the endless cycle of freezing and thawing, slowly but steadily it eats away as the rock at the rock, making it crumble into pieces and piles of rubble called scree. Scree, these fragments have greater surface area, making the weathering process work even faster. Over time and in certain conditions, the power of ice and water can weigh whole mountains down to nothing. 
Take a look at the picture. There's a rock with a crack in it and the water collects into the crack. Then the water freezes and expands, forcing the crack to widen. The water melts and flows it back into the crack and then the water goes deeper into the crack again and it freezes and it expands. And it goes deeper and it freezes and it expands. And it melts and goes deeper and then after a while it causes the cracks to split the rock in half and then it starts all over again with a new rock or with the same rock making it small pebbles isn't ice so destructive and powerful that's all folks